Well, first off, I just want to uh, welcome everyone to our uh, virtual breakfast this morning. Uh, my name is Samantha Daniel. I'll be your host. I'm the new Montcalm County Extension Specialist or Extension Educator for Field Crops. So first off, just a little bit uh, of uh, housekeeping. Uh, please mute yourself during the presentations so we don't hear any background noise. Also, it's helpful if you can sign in with your first and last name. Uh, in order to do that, you can click on the participant list at the bottom of the screen, find your name, hover over it with your cursor, click more and then rename. Uh, you can ask questions in the chat box found at the bottom of the screen as the presentation is, is going on. And then uh, at the end of the, of the presentation, we'll go through those. So the RUP and CCA codes will be given at around 7.30 a.m. So I want to uh, just kind of go through this a little bit. MSU extension programs are open to all. The collection of demographic data from program participants is an important and mandated aspect of all Michigan State University extension programming. This is voluntary and the information that you provide will not be used in any way to identify you personally, but rather as a member of a group that participated in this program. A link has been shared in the chat and this link will be shared a few times throughout the presentation. If you could, we ask that you take a moment to fill out that information. It's, it's very helpful for us. Thank you very much. So with that, I'm gonna turn, uh, turn it over to Dr. Chris Stefanzo and she's going to give us a midsummer insect update. Okay, so yes, yeah, so I'd like to give you an insect update today. And this is mostly gonna be about Western bean cutworm for obvious reasons. So just a summary about Western bean cutworm life cycle, they're overwintering as uh, in, in the uh, soil. We get adults usually late June, early July would be the, the earliest catch that we would possibly have. We get egg masses in corn usually first, um, maybe in early July, often more like mid to late July, and even some petering off into August. So that's where we are now. Uh, as well as at egg hatch too. So small larvae are, are movers. They will, many of them will move up into the tassel, making a dangerous journey up. And some we have found will actually head down to the silk if that is available, but most going to the tassel first. That tassel tissue is important because it's reproductive tissue and it has good nutrition. So if plants are not tasseling at all, like they're, they're very, very late planted corn, that would be a nutritional dead end, essentially, if, if there's no tassel at all. When they're about two to three, week, two to three weeks old, they are, are feeding in the silk then. If they've gone down from the tassel, made a dangerous journey down into the ear zone, and they feed on silks, and then they'll start to work on that ear tip a little bit into, the, into that moist tip. And when they're older, after three weeks of age, um, then they're feeding more into the tip, ev into some kernels, and sometimes they even go into the side of the ear. And that uh, then they last maybe another, let's see, if at four to five weeks, they then will kind of just sort of hang out for a while, or they would drop off the plant and bury down into the soil, and they will start that pupation process. So scouting is always recommended, and we always say after peak flight. And how do you determine that? Well, we use green bucket traps um, for that. And I just wanted to show you flight from our last really big year, which was 2011. I went back to my flight data, and 2011 was the last, the last biggest year, if you want to call it that. And then compared to trap counts this year, and I picked out two sites that we've trapped uh, continuously since Western Bean Cutworm has come in, almost the same identical placement of the trap in the same location. One is on the MSU campus on the Crops Farm. The other one is at the Saginaw Valley Farm, which is north of Frankenmuth. And you'll see, okay, I'm just starting off with the, with the MSU farm. Uh, the dashed line is this year, and the solid line would be last year. So you can see all the, the um, uh, flight is almost identical in timing as to 2011. It peaked at the same week, which was uh, collecting my traps on July 22nd and that it is petering down. And I didn't check that trap today, but I suspect it is down below 50. Uh, so same height of the peak, which is quite a few, more than 150 moths 
uh, on a on a single seven day period and then dramatically dropping. So exactly the same essentially. At Sevrec, it's quite different. The thumb early on. Uh, 10 years ago was not really a hot spot for Western bean cutworm. Uh, and you can see that in the trapping data from 2011, my high catch was like 30. This year, our high catch in one week was 200 and some in the trap on July 22nd. So let's see, 230 or so. So quite a bit different situation in the thumb, but the same, um, uh, the same time frame uh, for peak as on campus. So that July 22nd week was our peak. This is when that sweet spot of scouting would have occurred um, in that last week in July and into this first week of August. The difference between these two years is, though, in the timing of the corn. So pre-tasseled corn is very preferred by moths for egg laying. And by pre-tassel, I mean that you're looking at the field and all you see is that tassel kind of just peeking out there as it's rolled, uh, as there are leaves surrounding it. That tassel is there. The nutrition is there for these larvae, but the tassel is still hidden. It's nice and juicy and green. And if you imagine larvae getting into that rolled up ear with a tassel in the middle, they can feed without a lot of natural enemies perhaps finding them. So this is the ideal egg laying situation. In 2011, if I just go back, pre-tassel corn uh, was happening in that late July, early August timeframe. This year, many people planted in April. And in the time frame that we would have had a lot of flight, uh, I think there's a lot of fields that the tassel was already out. It was already shedding pollen and even maybe starting to dry up. So perhaps would not be particularly attractive to lady moths that are flying around. So here's an, in pre-tassel corn where they typically would lay, imagine the tassel uh, being wrapped up by these tassel leaves and they put the egg mass right on the outside of that or they lay, lay it right at the base of that tassel leaf so that those larvae can very quickly move into that right up into that tassel itself. Uh, and here we see the egg masses um, through the leaves which we use for scouting purposes. Again, this year, I've been in many fields. I haven't, I confess, I haven't found an egg mass yet myself in corn. And I have a few reports of some of our students going out and finding some, but not dramatic numbers in regular corn fields that already seem beyond the attractive stage. Your priority for scouting in this pre-tassel stage is pretty much all corn now, except VIP. VIP is the only toxin that has some uh, ability to stop Western bean cutworm. All of our other BT toxins were either non-functional against this pest or failed, for example, the Cry1F toxin. So really all corn fields are at risk for this pest. When corn fields are in sync, when they are all at the same stage, if you have Western bean cutworm uh, coming out of, a, of an area, they kind of disperse around the landscape. You know, the solution to pollution is dilution. Uh, when everything is, a, is around the same stage, they sort of dilute out. When cornfields are out of sync, we end up with these what I call no-brainer fields. So if most of the fields are not attractive anymore, and there's a couple that are late, a lot of moths will move into those late planted fields because they're the only thing that are pre-tassel. So if you have some later planted fields out there, if you look at your neighborhood and you see some fields that are a little bit behind, those are the fields that I would go to uh, after this giant uh, peak to look now for egg masses because you might be in a neighborhood where they've just been diluted out to the point where we can't find them, or you might have a field that is essentially acting like a trap crop. Our thresholds in Michigan and Ontario are 5%. That's not just 5% if you find 5% of the plants with an egg mass. It's also a, a cumulative threshold, meaning that you often find 1% or 2% infestation. You go out the next week and now you have 3% infestation and you add that together and that's 5%. So this is quite different from what we use in the Western US. We want you to do one application. We always prefer ground to air for coverage, and we don't want you to spray if you don't need to because resistance is a possibility. And spray timing can be really tricky. 
because uh, although there's a lot of products, you need to time the sprays when the small ones are still up on the plant and the larvae are moving or may be exposed in the silk. Once they're down on that ear tip, then spraying would be quite difficult because they tend to spread to, to uh, stay in an ear or a couple of ears and they don't move around a lot. If you do the tank mixes, and I know you all are going to, of fungicides and insecticides, as we've talked about in previous weeks, we always optimize the fungicide component. Fungicides have to be applied at a certain spray timing. They're very expensive, much more expensive than the insecticides that you can get. And if, uh, if you're wasting your fungicide, then why are you bothering to do that tank mix? Now, uh, why are we managing Western bean cutworm? Well, one is for yield loss. Um, Yes, you can get dramatic yield losses. University of Nebraska uh, has estimated that one larvae per plant is a 15 bushel yield loss. And these are some drama pictures showing, you know, some dramatic sort of fields where we've had loss. These are fields from 2010 and 2011 where we had a huge outbreak and this pest was new. And frankly, these fields are pretty rare. What's more typical is this tip feeding where you have a tip that doesn't really fill out it's moist and juicy. Uh, it's feeding in the tip and it's not really taking, when you actually measure it, it's not really taking any viable kernels. It's just feeding on the silks and that moist tip. Uh, and the damage that we see in Michigan, the problem that we see in Michigan and Ontario, isn't so much yield loss. That's pretty rare. It's this quality concern that they open the husk up for other insects. They poop in there. Uh, other insects get in and start to work. Birds come in and start picking a little bit. So you get the damaged kernels, the, 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 the frass, the wounds where ear molds can get in under moist conditions. And then the ear mold infection can, not always, but can lead to mycotoxin issues. So we're talking more about a, preventing a quality issue, which is why our threshold is much lower. Here's some data from Ontario that shows uh, this was a, a, a trial that was done a, a few years ago uh, using uh, a fungicide at a few different timings. So there was a check and then they sprayed plots at different timings. In the yellow are the optimal timings for uh, the fungicide to go on. And the, the orange bars are yield and the yield was not significantly different. Um, so in other words, the controlling of the Western bean cutworm, if they were that, not there, did not necessarily affect yield. What was different though, was the amount, was the dawn level, which is on the right hand side here in then this dashed line. So the lowest dawn uh, levels were when you applied the fungicide at the right timing. So again, the fungicide timing is critical with these tank mixes. You really need to manage unrealistic expectations for Western bean cutworm control. You, would have, you often have to scout multiple times. The egg laying can frustratingly go on for several weeks, especially if there's a lot of within field variability. I don't really see that this year, but we, we are past kind of our, um, probably our optimal time for a lot of these cornfields. It's hard to achieve the best coverage. And you can have ear molds without the insects even being there. There can be good years for ear molds and mycotoxin, regardless of Western bean cutworm. Western bean cutworm simply enhances that damage and yield, although that has been very hard to predict. Now, if corn isn't attractive, where are they going? Well, they'll find something else, and the something else is either sweet corn, and I was in sweet corn yesterday and yet found no egg masses and I would have laid eggs there. The other option in some places are dry beans. And that's a concern because they get under that dry bean canopy and we can't see the egg laying at all. So those of you in the Montcalm County area or the thumb, dry beans are an issue now. In dry beans, they hide out in blossoms first and maybe feed a little bit on pods, but then they become a climbing cutworm and live on the ground and move up and down onto different plants every day. And frankly, they're a lot easier to manage in dry beans. We have, they move around, so they expose themselves to pesticide. We have um, time to spray them and you can get better coverage. This is data that we generated and published uh, out of Michigan. And it shows a, a pick either done by machine or by hand or damaged beans, essentially. And we either sprayed 
apply four times. So four applications, just pummeling it with pesticide or different timings up to 18 days after infestation. And even at 18 days after infestation, the pick was very low. So in dry beans, you have time to get that application on. And we have a very good relationship and pod damage. So when they start to feed on pods, we know when you get to about 10% of your pods kind of fed on on the outside, that would be about 1% pick. And most uh, processing by machines can actually handle that. So right now is a good time to spray your dry beans and into next week. And uh, be careful of your pre-harvest intervals. But this is the time to spray and protect your dry beans. And you're going to get potentially uh, uh, three weeks of protection there against eggs that are hatching and the larvae that are already there. Now, for the rest of the season, this is an example of the morning uh, yesterday as I drove into campus. It's been dewy and hum hum lots of humidity. This is insect killing weather for aphids and leaf hoppers, even some of the caterpillars because of the diseases that will, um, that will get them. Uh, now, if you're a dry bean grower, now is the time to think about your application for Western bean cutworm. And as we get into later in August, that's the time to assess your corn for Western bean feeding and those ear molds. And if you have particularly crummy fields that you find, those should be targeted for earlier harvest and maybe dry, dry them rather than leave them in the field to kind of uh, get more ear molds. Um, that's what I've got for now. I'm, I'm at the end of my time. I'm uh, ending my show. I'm going to stop my share. And um, I think I'm almost out of time. And uh, Samantha, let me just read one thing here. I saw one of the okay. students has sent me something. Uh, one of the students that was scouting says they barely found egg masses at Ottawa. Uh, let's see, less than 1% uh, of the plants. Huron County, they got uh, low numbers and Lenaway was less than 1%. So they are scouting Nanny Singh's plots for Western Bean Cutworm and are getting pretty low numbers. I know they scouted campus. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's very low, at least in their, in their scouting. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Uh, so now is the time for questions. I'm going to check the, the chat box and see um, what we have here. So here's one from uh, Bruce McKellar. Chris, how does accumulated growing degree days seem to impact peak moth flight? I'm curious how growing degree days were in 2021 compared to 2011. So there was a Western model on degree days for Western bean cutworm that has uh, historically did not work in our region. It did not predict uh, flight. And uh, with only my one screen here today, I did not pull up the MON site to do the comparison. I've well, only had so much, so much stuff here. So I don't know how 2021 uh, compared to 2011 uh, at those, like at MSU and Sevrec. I'd have to I'd have to compare that in in the other I'd have to open the website and compare that. Okay, great. Um, do we have more questions from the audience? I'm going down through. Um, someone had a sweet corn question. What guidance do I have for sweet corn? You know, um, ah, most of the time, most of the sweet corn folks have multiple plantings, and the problem with sweet corn is one of those plantings tends to line up with western bean cutworm flight. Um, in sweet corn though, we, we don't have many issues. I don't, I don't get any calls and, and I don't cover sweet corn because it's a vegetable, but most of you are spraying for corn borer and for earworm anyway. And those other sprays pick up Western bean cutworm as well. Now I have a, a plot of sweet corn that's being used to monitor the different types of BTs that are, that are out there. I'm not planting it for sweet corn. I'm planting it for, for another reason. We have a couple of these plots out there. And I went up yesterday and scouted that, and it is at a, it's at a place where the bucket trap was loaded with moths two, one or two weeks ago, and the corn is at what I would lay eggs in. I would put my eggs there, and we didn't find any egg masses at all. So I can't explain these very high bucket trap catches where we're going into corn and trying to pick out 
pre-tassel plants and still not finding uh, the, the level of egg masses that I would have expected if this were 2010 and 2011. Someone, uh, someone sent me a message that asked, what are the preferred products for dry beans? Uh, in dry beans, you have a lot of pyrethroids. You have to be careful, though. Some of the pre-harvest intervals are 21 days, and some of the beans that I, that I saw yesterday had, you know, three, four-inch pods on them and are probably almost within that four-week, three, three to four-week period to harvest. But there are some things like by, bifenthrin that are 14 days. So... I don't necessarily recommend one product over another, just that uh, some of these pyrethroids can last a couple weeks, especially on, in these hazy conditions that Jeff is reporting from, from the smoke. That's almost our friend in some way because uh, those hazier conditions would allow that pyrethroid residue to last longer. So if you can get like a 10-day residue profile there and they're moving around the plant, then they can crawl over residue. Now, if, if there's hot temperatures, uh, I don't, whatever hot was considered to Jeff next week, that would make residue dissipate faster. So there's sort of a balance there between the hot 90, temperatures. Chris, highs of 90. Probably. Yeah. So that, that would be, especially for pyrethroid, pyrethroids tend to work better in, in a little bit cooler temperatures. Um, but, but the, the most important thing for, for you guys that are growing dry beans is to get, to get a spray on and you can walk your fields. Now I have a sweep net and I can sweep and I can actually find, uh, I, if I, if I had found them, which I haven't yet, I could actually find little teeny, um, caterpillars in, in a, in a sweep net. I think from a practical standpoint for, for, for dry bean growers, you can see the little beginnings of chewing right into the pod. Now they're not going straight into it yet, but they're just starting to, to kind of chew on it. So, but again, I haven't had any reports of that yet. I haven't seen it myself. And uh, I don't know if Scott Bales is on, he's probably walked more fields than anybody. Um, and I don't think Scott has necessarily seen uh, larvae yet in dry beans. So Chris, I'm going to, I'm going to pop in here and just say that, so if we're not seeing anything in dry beans so far, we should maybe wait a little bit uh, before we pull the trigger on and an application I, of a the pesticide. Thing, the thing with dry beans is you, you won't find moths, you won't find egg masses, and you would only find larvae when they're, when they're larger, unless you're me and you have a sweep net and you know what you're looking for. So with dry beans, the risk is very high. Where are they putting their eggs if they're not going into corn? There's limited options. They don't egg lay in other crops except dry beans and sweet, sweet corn. So if I'm, the, the moth catches are uh, huge in some places. I, I, I forgot to mention there were some trap catches in the cold water area that were over eight, 800 wow. a couple of weeks ago. And that looks like 2011. And uh, Scott Bales, I know, S Samantha, you're checking traps in the Montcalm County area. What were your traps two weeks ago, I guess? What were the counts? Uh, two weeks ago, yeah, they were, um, they were up in, I think, the 80s, well, I somewhere think it, 100. Yeah, I think there was some several, multiple hundreds in some yeah. of those, the, the, those, those traps. So... Um, by, I want dry bean growers in those areas to, to treat. Okay. There's, this right. is, there's just too, too much of a risk. We have good history with this. What I'm hoping is when loads of beans come in, uh, you know, come in to the, uh, and then they're going to be screened, it would sure be nice to ask those folks as they're bringing a load in, was this treated and what date? So we would have that comparison. So if things were treated too early, too late or not treated that that because we have a threshold this 10 percent pod feeding threshold and we have a good timing but this is the this is the real test of it this year i think i'm going to shift gears a little bit and I, i'm going to ask if uh, marty chilvers is on this morning i thought i saw him earlier um if if he is on and he, he is marty can you give us uh -huh. do you have an update on 
uh, what some of the the western bean Oops. cutworm work ah. and what that relate how that relates to uh, some of these ear rots and ear molds that we have the potential for. Oh uh, yeah, okay. So in terms of Chris sort of covered it. So in terms of the western bean cutworm, um, especially opening up the, uh, the ear through the side. I mean, it's just going to increase the amount of vomitoxin in the ear. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's bad from a mycotoxin perspective. Um, it doesn't, when we get a true um, ear mold infection through the silks, it tends to be a lot worse that way. But, yeah, certainly uh, the Western Med cutworm damage can lead to levels that are unacceptable. Well, one of the reasons why I bring that up is because Manny Singh has been doing some corn silage work the last two years, collecting samples, and 100% of those samples had vomitoxin or Don levels that were detectable. So it's something that I'm seeing more often, and I just wondered if you have been part of that research or, or not. Yeah, I mean, if you go looking, you're going to find it, really, right? That's sort of the deal. Um, it, it's yeah, they're out there, and that's an issue for sure. And, and do you have an update on tar spot? How that has been crossing the state or not? Yeah, I mean, you sent me some pictures yesterday, right? Um, so it's it's increasing. I mean, wherever it has been found in previous years, it's going to be in those counties. It just may be hard to find. So, for example, in Huron County, um, it's probably still fairly hard to find. Uh, just we only had a few fields that were infected last year. Um, but for most of the other um, counties in the lower part of the state, I mean, it's already been found and levels are certainly ramping up uh, pretty quickly. We also have reports now of or got a confirmation of southern rust. I think that was in Shiawassee County. Um, yeah. Southern rust is pretty aggressive. So, <laughs> sorry. So that's, that's another one to sort of be concerned about. Um, northern leaf spot as well, which produces very sort of um, thin, uh, long lesions. Um, that's also been detected. And that, that's been a concern in previous years. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things out there. It's not just tar spot. So I think getting out and scouting is really important. We're probably getting towards, you know, we're certainly approaching when a fungicide app is no longer effective, I guess. We probably, depending on how much disease is there and whatnot, we still probably have a couple of weeks. But, you know, that window is closing pretty quickly. And you certainly don't want to be in there, you know, after task spot has like really taken off and done a lot of damage because then it's going to be too late. And Marty, your fungicides are very expensive <laughs> compared to my cheapo... You know, so uh, again, I want to emphasize that Marty's timings are very critical on those tank mixes. Yeah, and like so, normally we're well on the on the ear mold side of things, right? We're thinking about trying to apply um, during silking as well to try and suppress any infection through the silk. And obviously, that that timing's pretty well pretty well passed now. The other thing I want to mention is I've gotten a lot of um, pictures in the last couple of days of people sending me pictures of aphids or a leaf that's been eaten by something in soybean for the, for the most part. And, uh, you know, asking if 50 aphids a plant is that bad uh, or a hundred. Well, remember the aphid thresholds are for that early R stages that 250 per, per plant, that's the threshold. The, the injury level is like over 600 per, per, per plant. At this stage of the game, we're, we're looking at, you'd need 800 to 1,000 per plant to cause actual yield loss as we move into the, into the later R, R stages. And look at the mornings, look at the dewy mornings. Aphids are gonna die if they're increasing from entomopathogens. So this is aphid killing weather. So yeah, I wouldn't be lured into spray in some population that's, that's pretty low. And the things that are eating out there, man, those defoliation thresholds are high. So a grasshopper eating here or there or whatever, you know, I, unless the field is, and again, these fields are so rare, unless it's being completely defoliated. And I don't know what that would be. You know, again, this is like 
either fishing time or I guess for Marty spraying fungicide time or something, but it's not spray soybean for the 50 aphids kind of thing time. Sounds good. Thank you, Chris. Um, I don't see any more questions. So um, I think with that, we can probably wrap everything up. Um, I just want to thank everyone for, for attending today.